everybody. Welcome to chapter 21. Um, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and talk about uh, the short run uh, again this, this chapter. In the earlier chapters, so before we did chapter 20, but every chapter I had showed you before then, we covered the long-run effects of fiscal policy and the long-run effects of monetary policy. Namely, uh, fiscal policy can um, increase interest rates, which unfortunately decreases investment if the government spends more than it takes in. That's because the market for loanable funds is running out of money. And the long-run effects of monetary policy on real variables is nothing, and it only can change nominal variables such as price level and inflation rate. However, we're going to go ahead and continue with what we learned last chapter, the ASAD model, uh, to look at the short run effects of fiscal and monetary policy. So what can the government do in the short run uh, working through the aggregate demand? All right, so remember, aggregate demand slopes downward for three reasons. The wealth effect, price goes up, consumption goes down. The interest rate effect, price goes up, investment goes down and the exchange rate effect. Price goes up, the net exports goes down. All right, uh, This is the most important of these effects for the US economy, and it's the largest one. So basically, when mon mon monetary policy makers or fiscal policy makers um, try to shift the AD curve, they target the interest rate effect, meaning they try to target investment, I. OK, so let's understand how they can change investment by um, by using monetary policy. So here's a, a supply and demand model that helps us remember. But before we begin, let's talk about what liquidity preference means. Well, basically, um, it's going to give us uh, the theory that leads us to how to find how to find the interest the real interest rate R, right? And in any supply and demand model, R adjusts to balance supply and demand. So money supply comes from the central bank, the Fed and uh, money demand reflects how much wealth people want to hold. So basically, you can suppose household wealth includes two assets, money, which is liquid but no interest, bonds, pays interest but it's not as liquid, okay? The household can split its wealth in between e either of those. So the de money demand basically is how much money they want instead of bonds in their portfolio. What influences money demand? Why the real interest rate, or excuse me, why the real output, R, the real interest rate, and P, the price level. These things affect the amount of money demand. So uh, suppose real income rises. What, what happens to money demand? Well, if real income rises, people have more money. They want to buy more goods and services, so they need more money. To get this money, they sell some of their bonds, meaning they can convert their bonds into cash. So basically, that means that if you have Y going up, it makes money demand going up, all other things being equal. All right, and now I let you think about what happens to um, R and P when R and P change, okay? So we're gonna have R change and then P changes, and then uh, I want you to tell me what happens to money demand. So why don't you pause it, think about this, and then come back in a couple seconds when you're done. All right, well if R rises, basically what this is saying is it's the opportunity cost of holding money. The bonds are going up, they're paying more money. So Basically what households do is decrease the amount of money and buy more bonds. So an increase in R makes a decrease in money because they go and buy bonds instead. All right, and what happens if the price rises? Well, remember that the real income is unchanged. So all that's happening is that the price is rising. People are still buying the same amount of goods and services, but the price tag, the number on the price tag is higher, so they need more dollar bills in order to buy the same amount of goods and services as before. So an increase in P causes an increase in money demand. All right, so how, how does this look on, on the graph? Well, we know that the money supply is fixed by the Fed at some, at some rate and does not change with regard to R, the interest rate. But money demand is downward sloping. And we saw that because just last slide, we saw that when the interest rate changes, when R goes down, we know that money demand goes up. All right, and so that's what's giving the MD curve its uh, downward slope. Okay, from that we can find an equilibrium interest rate. Now, here's how it works on the AD curve. Let's suppose that the price level falls, right? So prices fall. That means that people don't need as much money, so the money demand curve slides to the left, right? Which decreases the real interest rate, which encourages firms to invest more, I. So when I goes up, that's going to make Y go up, and it'll make it go up to Y too. So kind of a way we can see, yet again, why the AD curve slopes downwards. Now. What can the uh, 
the policymakers do? Well, they have there's two basic ways. There's monetary policy, which means what the Fed does, and the Federal Reserve Bank, they can increase money supply. There's fiscal policy, that's what the like the uh, legislative branch, like Congress, and, and they can do. We're going to focus on monetary policy right now. So how do they use monetary policy to shift the AD curve? Well, they can target money supply, right? And the news uh, often reports that the Fed targets the interest rate, but really, they it's just that they're looking at the federal funds rate, which is the banks charge each other on short-term loans, and then they change the amount of money supply in order to change this interest rate. So the, really the only thing the Fed actually touches is the money supply, but it also ends up changing the interest rate and the AD curve. Here's how it happens. Imagine that the Fed reduces the money supply, right? Well, then the interest rate rises. And when the interest rate rises, firms, need, firms that are investors, I, are taking less loans to make investments. Remember, once again, investment in this class does not mean buying stocks and bonds. It means taking a loan in order to build a factory or something or other sort of physical capital, right? So when the interest rate goes up, firms can take fewer loans, so therefore their investment goes down um, to Y2, and that's gonna give us a new um, AD curve. So in the short run, when the Fed reduces money supply, AD curve shifts to the left only in the short run, though. Remember, this is all short run. So think about what happens in each of these events below. See what happens to the short run, and then see how the Fed can fix it, okay? So we have Congress balancing the budget by cutting spending, stock market boom, and oil prices rising. I want you to go ahead and draw the same thing that um, I showed you on the last slide. It'd take a couple seconds, hit pause, do it, and then come back when you're ready. All right, so when Congress balances the budget by cutting spending, it reduces aggregate demand, right? So if you draw the aggregate demand on your graph, it slides to the left. Well then, so that was from last chapter. This chapter, what can the, the Fed do? Well, they can increase money supply and reduce R, which is gonna increase investment, which is gonna bump up the aggregate demand back to the right, and they'll fix the problem. What happens if a stock market increases household wealth? Well, that's going to make aggregate demand go up. What can the Fed, and that, that we learned last chapter. What this chapter, what can the Fed do with monetary supply? Well, they reduce monetary supply. That will increase the R, the real interest rate. Firms will take less investments, I will go down, and aggregate demand will shift to the left. And finally, war breaks out in the Middle East, causing oil prices to soar. This changes the aggregate supply curve, right? Causing output to fall, right? Our aggregate supply moves to the left. The Fed can increase the money supply, and, and then that will reduce the real interest rate, increase in investment, increase aggregate demand, push it to the right in order to bring us back to YN. So the Fed can only push the money, they put so much money into the economy before the interest rate hits zero, okay? Um, they like to reduce the interest rate, but once the interest rate hits zero, the Fed can't put any more money in and reduce interest rates any farther. This is known as a liquidity trap, right? Monetary policy cannot work. And even, and even worse, if the Fed keeps pumping money into the economy, it can actually make real interest rates negative by raising inflation expectations. Um, so what the, the central bank can do in this situation, and we did it in 2008, 2009, is instead of buying and selling bonds on the open market to um, raise and lower the money supply, they can start buying up other assets. And in 20, 2008 and 2009, they bought up mortgages, they bought up corporate debt um, in order to, uh, to buy up other, other things besides bonds since they were already at the zero lower bound uh, for bonds. All right, now let's sh switch gears. Let's leave the monetary policy and start with fiscal policy. So the people who do fiscal policy is not the Fed. That's monetary policy. The people who do fiscal policy is the government, okay? The setting um, of the level of government spending and taxation by the policymakers. So you can think the president or Congress or even state and local governments, anybody not the Fed, um, they, can, they can do fiscal policy. So if you have expansionary fiscal policy, what, is that, what that does is it increases government spending or it decreases taxes. But both of these things both shift the AD to the right, right? Because if you shift uh, government spending up, that shifts the AD to the right. If you shift taxes down, that's gonna make consumption go up, which is gonna shift the AD curve to the right. Contractionary fiscal policy is the opposite. We're trying to shift the AD to the left. So what do we do? We either decrease government spending or increase taxes, which will shift the AD curve to the left, all right? And fiscal policy has two effects on the aggregate demand curve. So first is the multiplier effect. 
Imagine the government buys $20 billion of planes from Boeing. Boeing's revenue goes up by $20 billion, and the aggregate demand shifts $20, 20 billion to the right. Okay, But then the $20 billion is distributed to Boeing's workers and owners, and these people go ahead and start spending more money also, which makes C go up, which makes the AD curve go uh, to the right even farther, right? An increase in aggregate demand of more than $20 billion, right? This is called the multiplier effect. It's when the AD curve sh keeps shifting to the right, not from the government spending anymore, but because of the extra spending that the government did is making people spend more in their consumption. Okay, so here's how it looks. The $20 billion shift in G initially shifts aggregate demand by $20 billion, right? We have a rightward shift. But then all this extra money that was paid to the Boeing workers, they go and they buy stuff, and then other people start buying more stuff too, so then the consumption level goes up, and then AD shifts to the right again. And so this extra movement is called the multiplier effect. Now, how, just how far to the right does the multiplier effect work? Well, it depends upon how much consumers respond to increases in income. We call this the marginal propensity consume. It's a number between zero and one. It's the fraction of extra income that households consume rather than save. So imagine that the households had an MPC of 0.8. That means that if income comes rises $100, consumption rises $80, right? So when the government spends to those 20 billion extra dollars, the consumers spend 80% of it. So the uh, AD, command, uh, AD curve moves to the right um, according to the MPC. Right, so how do we find this out what the multiplier is? Well, delta G is the change in G, delta Y, delta C are the changes in Y and C. We know that this is true, right? That's the um, identity for the GDP. And if uh, government spending is changing, is increasing, we know it changes uh, total income and we know it changes people's consumption habits. We don't think that it changes either of these. So we're gonna, gonna drop those out and just say that when G changes, that Y and C changes. Well, we know that C changes exactly how much? Well, by this, the marginal propensity to consume times delta Y, right? So how much of the, how many of those extra government spending dollars do people spend for consumption? Well, they just spend however much total extra income that they got times the marginal propensity to consume, or the fraction of those dollars that they spend, okay? And I can move MPC times delta y over on the other side and solve to get delta y by itself and I get that delta g is equal to uh, times 1 over 1 minus mpc is equal to delta y so we call this the multiplier in other words if government spending goes up by one dollar then uh, the ad curve shifts to the right by one dollar times this guy right here right and so this is going to clearly be a, a number greater than one since this is between zero and one this whole thing will be a number greater than one let me show you so uh, imagine that mpc is 0.5 then the denominator is 1 minus 0.5, and so this gives you 0.5 on the bottom. 1 divided by 0.5 is going to be 2, all right? And the same thing is going to happen. The MPC is 0.75, multiplier is 4, MPC is 0.9, the multiplier is 10. So the bigger MPC means a bigger multiplier. All right, so how else can this happen? Well, we know that it works for government spending, but it also can work for any other component of GDP. Um, unfortunately, it also works backwards too. So suppose a, net, a recession makes net exports go down by $10 billion, aggregate demand falls by $10 billion, but then it keeps falling because of the multiplier effect, right? When, when the aggregate demand falls by $10 billion, income Y falls by $10 billion, but then everybody gets poor, so they stop spending as much, consumption goes down, right? So it further reduces aggregate demand and income. Okay, so the first way that uh, fiscal policy can affect the AD curve was um, the multiplier effect. The second is the crowding out effect, and this is the bad one. This is this is the opposite direction. So um, when when the government spends more money to push up the AD curve, unfortunately, they a lot of times do that by taking out loans, which raises R in their market for loanable funds, which means that firms can't invest anymore, and it reduces the net increase in aggregate demand. Now remember, once again, investment is, is firms building factories. It is not people putting their money in the stock market. That we call savings, okay? So the size of the aggregate demand shift is smaller than the initial fiscal expansion because it moves, let's say the government spends uh, money, so that moves the AAD curve to the right, but then some of the firms, they can't afford to take out any loans anymore, so it moves it back to the left just a little bit. All right, we call that the crowding out effect. Let me show you. 
Uh, let's suppose that $20 billion increase in government spending when the government bought those planes from Boeing shifts the AD right by $20 billion. Unfortunately, with higher income means people want more money demand, so that makes the interest rate go up, and uh, then when the interest rate goes up, the firms can't get out loans anymore to do investment, so it comes back down a little bit. So the AD curve doesn't shift out quite as much as it should be. All right. Another thing that they can do besides just spending government money is they can change our tax rate. So if they, if they cut our taxes, it increases our take home pay, then we go ahead and spend more of that uh, and that shifts the AD curve to the right. The size of the shift is affected by the multiplier and the crowding out effects, just like you would imagine. Also, whether households perceive the tax cut to be temporary up or not. A permanent tax cut makes the uh, AD curve shift to the right more. A temporary tax cut, people don't really make their spending go up too much because they imagine that you know the tax cut's going to go away in the future and they're going to have to pay that tax cut back. Okay, so suppose the economy is in a recession. We need to shift the AD curve to the right by $200 billion, and the MPC is 0.8. How much does Congress need to increase government spending? And then imagine there is crowding out. Will Congress need to increase government spending more or less than this amount? Take a second, think about it, and then come back. All right, so if MPC is 0.8, that means the multiplier is 1 over 1 minus MPC. 1 over 1 minus 0.8, that's 1 over 0.2, that equals 5. So it means every government dollar of government spending is going to be $5 in shifting the AD curve to the right. So I only need to shift... Uh, increase government spending by $40 billion because that will make the, a, the whole AD curve shift by $200 billion to the right. However, if there's crowding out, meaning that when I um, when the government takes out money to, to spend this $40 billion, it crowds out investment spending, so investment falls, then the government's going to actually have to put more than $40 billion into government spending uh, to get a, a rightward shift of $200 billion. All right. So um, we also might have effects of fiscal policy on aggregate supply, okay? Uh, and how, how would that happen? Well, because people respond to incentives. So if I cut taxes, that might make workers work more, so that'll actually shift the AS curve to the right, right? It'll shift the, shift the aggregate supply curve um, because the aggregate demand curve is the buyers, the aggregate supply curve is the, the makers, the producers, the firms, and so if, firm, if people are working harder, then um, the AS curve is going to shift to the right. Okay, and so people who believe this effect is large are called supply siders. All right, government purchases can also affect aggregate supply. Think about this. Imagine the government spends $40 billion, but instead of buying something worthless, they buy roads. Well, this is going to make businesses be able to you know, ship goods between each other, so maybe they're more productive. It increases the quantity of goods and, sold, goods and services, and the AS curve shifts to the right, right? So this probably happens, but it's probably only happening in the long run, right? Because it takes time to build the new roads and put them into use. Okay, so should we use either monetary or fiscal policy to stabilize the economy, meaning to bring our Y back to YN, okay? Basically, the idea is should we follow the Keynesian idea or should we follow the um, classical idea? Well, since the Employment Act of 1946, the government has decided to use economic stabilization um, by, to use policy to affect economic stabilization. But economists are on both sides, okay? Some people say, yes, we should use stabilization. These are the Keynesians, right? Um, they, they say that aggregate demand goes up and down, and so and uh, by many factors, booms and recessions abroad, stock market booms and crashes, if policymakers do nothing, eventually it'll fix itself in the long run. But in the short run, it's just really disabling to businesses and workers and consumers. So what we should do, these people say, is the government should use policy to reduce these fluctuations. So if GDP falls down, but maybe the AD curve shifts to the left, then uh, we should use expansionary monetary or fiscal policy, either one of them, to, to prevent the recession. Or if GDP is too high, use contractionary monetary or fiscal policy to prevent or reduce an inflationary boom, to bring that AD curve back to the left. Okay, Who's been a Keynesian? John Kennedy, Barack Obama recently has uh, in 2008-2009 uh, took us out of the recession by increasing spending and uh, making tax cuts. Okay, and then of course there are people who thinks that who think that um, the Keynesian approach is is not the way to go. Okay, monetary policy affects economy the economy with a long lag. They say, right? Just because you put more money in the into the 
into the economy doesn't mean that I is going to immediately increase, right? It takes a long time for firms to make investment plans, right? So most economists believe it takes at least six months for monetary policy to affect output and employment. And here we are only talking about the short run of a year or two. Um, in the long run, after a year or two, everything's going to go back to uh, where it should be anyway. So people say, why do something that w takes six months to have an effect when I know that the negative parts of the recession is only going to last a year or two anyway? Fiscal policy, the same thing. It works with a long lag. If you want to make the government spend more or cut taxes, you got to go through Congress. They spend years debating, and then finally they um, come up with uh, the bill that, that you wanted them to pass. And so it's very possible that uh, actually the crisis or the recession will have already passed by the time that these um, government and fiscal policy, fiscal policy and monetary policy even um, activates or even takes effect, right? So, um, you know, if we're already in the long run, by the time the policies affect aggregate demand, then I'm actually pushing the aggregate demand in the way it shouldn't go, right? So these people think that uh, policymakers should focus on uh, economic growth and inflation and not fixing short-run little uh, recessions, okay? They also argue that there's these things called automatic stabilizers, which basically are things that change fiscal policy to push the AD curve up without anybody actually having to do any deliberate action. Here's an example, the tax system. In a recession, right, the AD curve shifts to the left, and we want to push the AD curve to the right. Well, taxes fall automatically because people are poor, and so that's like a tax cut. So people go ahead and consume more, pushes the AD curve back up to the right. Government spending, the same thing, right? In a recession, the AD curve falls to the left, but people are poor, so they apply for welfare or unemployment insurance, which gives them extra dollars, which allows them to spend C, increase C, and push the AD curve to the right automatically, right, without any policymaker having to make a law or, or anything like that to increase spending. Okay, so in conclusion, policymakers need to consider all the effects of their actions, right? When Congress cuts taxes, they have to consider short-run and long-run effects. When the Fed changes monetary, uh, the money supply, it has to take into account long-run and short-run.